I'm I'm spoiled compared to other people. Uh, people do not have thick skin, and people do not have a multitude of gifts. There are so many people whose businesses have failed, and they need to know they're not alone. And they need to know, guys, it's okay to fail. There were people watching Zuma when he get attacked and they see him laugh. And they're like, this guy doesn't even take us seriously. Whereas to me, I'm like, I think he's laughing as a coping mechanism. Yeah. I think it's him. If he doesn't laugh, he's going to cry. If he doesn't laugh, he's going to break That's down. A lot, eh? If he doesn't laugh, he might actually retaliate violently to the people accusing him of things. All right, guys, welcome to the Winner Circle on the It's More Than Just Money Movement channel. And as I promised you, I'm going to bring you uh, every week on a Monday, people that are doing amazing things in the country and abroad. And today I have, a, you know, this guy, what we used to call him, uh, Andrew and I, we used to call him Shkwembu Penuel. Shkwembu. Yeah, Shkwembu means God. I can't even call oh. yourself God. And we're like, uh, boom. So, so, so what happened is that I, we were in Bloom. We were kickstarting the It's More Than Just Money movement. Yeah. And I came to you. We chatted a bit. It was after I sent you, sent you my book and yeah. said, read it. Give me a, rev a review. Let me know what you think. Yeah. And then I come to you. I talk to you. So he comes to me. He's stronger. He comes to me. Hey, I'm not going to be And I'm like, yeah, sure. I'm not going to then we started to laugh about it. Sure. So from that day, we called you Shkwembu Penwell. So just no, know, thank you. if you hear someone telling you that I call you Shkwembu Penwell, you heard it from me for the first time. Uh, I looked at your bio and I'm like, geez, this guy, straight A student from grade one to matric, yeah. head boy, a rugby player, choir, you, you, in the, you were a choir boy, studied several businesses. Some succeeded, some most, failed. Most failed. 13 books. Yeah. A successful podcast, well, in my eyes. Thank in the, you. And in the, in the rest of South Africa, I'm guessing. Thank you. Uh, another sub-channel that's also growing and mm -hmm. doing well. I mean, where do you get the, the, the wisdom? And I, I'll tell you, first time I saw your video. So your video comes up. I think it must have been something you showed on TikTok. Yeah. And back then, I think during COVID, your videos were then posted on Facebook. Mm. So I see your video. I'm like, eh. So, so I'm looking at it. I'm like, I, I wonder what this guy has to say. And then you said you spoke and spoke and spoke. I'm like, hey, the guy is smart. Hey, follow. Yo. Then I would see some of your posts that were controversial. I'm like, hey. I and then you got one account got banned. No, I didn't unfollow. One oh. of your accounts got banned on Facebook or something. Yeah, and yeah. you started another one. No, I didn't start another one. What happened? I used to get suspended. Like oh, you every month for 30 days. So I disappear for 30 days at a time. Facebook jail. Yeah. Where does your story start? And thank you for coming. By the no, way. we're supposed thank to you. have you at the Quality Growth uh, Business Expo. It would have been lovely to hear you speak. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad that you took the time to have this interview with me. Welcome to the Winner Circle. Thank you so much for the invite. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to give a shout out to the guys here. Give them a shout uh, out. I just want to say thank you to Andrew, to Nico, and to Utando for their amazing hospitality in welcoming me here and yourself. Uh, I am not an African spirituality practitioner, mm. but I do believe in uh, some of the aspects. And some of it is about the universe and nature. I think us meeting in Bloemfontein was uh, the universe communicating. Mm. Uh, us working with mutual people that we've worked with people like TJ Spoo I sure. think it was the universe communicating uh, us linking on uh, financial literacy conversations and money and property I think is the universe so I'm, I'm honored uh, that the universe has forced us to sit here today so thank you very much awesome thank um, you I was in Bloemfontein with an amazing young lady called Sipati uh, Tabudi she runs a non-profit organization called Puisano they most Mostly work in Davidson, Ego mm. Um, Very passionate about youth upliftment. She runs a skills development center. Her father, who passed away, she wrote a book in his honor uh, because he was very passionate about education and upliftment. So when I was in Bloemfontein, we were going to do charity work. They're handing over groceries, 
and blankets to old age homes. We went to um, high schools and we gave dignity packs to young girls. So we were going to do, I guess, what people would call God's work, Shikwembo's work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I, I met with you, which was, which was pretty dope. So I'm honored. Um, most of my early, we'd call it success, uh, but success is not defined by us. It's defined by the people in power. Mm. Most of my, what is deemed success from a school level was not my doing. So the ability to read information and then keep it and then spit it back on an exam paper. I wasn't born putting in work. I think I have to give a shout out to my parents and my grandparents. Mm. Many kids are not born with the photographic memory, which doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It just means according to society's success, you lack this thing. Yeah. In another world, success was your ability to run fast and hunt very well. So I don't know in that world if I would have been great. You don't so, know if you would have been a hunter. I would have been forced to hunt, but I just don't know if... So being a straight A student means you're good at books. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean you're good at being athletic or being a fighter. In an, a war zone, if you're just good at books but not good at fighting, the fighter becomes the more successful person. Sure. So we live in a money world today where the guy with money is deemed more successful. The guy mm. without money is deemed unsuccessful, but you might find he's good looking. You might find he's athletically built. Yeah. You might find he's a very good human being, but he just doesn't have money. So one of the things we need to challenge in the decolonization agenda is redefining success. Not just for all of us, but for individuals. Uh, Sia Kolis, captain yeah. of the Springboks. Yeah. No one knows how he did at school. No one and cares. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. By the way, yeah. But we know that his gift is rugby. He's physically built like a machine. Yeah. If C and I were to come and collide, I would end up in ICU. He has been given a gift and he's successful in his gift. Uh, yo, I'm sorry for using this example because he's been cancelled. Mm. There are rumors that R. Kelly can't mm. read or write. Oh, you can't read or write? Rumors. How did you write the songs? So I, you don't have to write songs. Look at Africans. Sing we sing songs. They can be transcribed so, for us. According okay. to rumor, he can't read or write, but he's a musical genius. No one cares if he did well at school or not, but he used his gift. So success will need to be figuring out what your gift is in an environment mm. and then igniting your gift so that you can reap the rewards of society. Yeah, I'm glad you started like that. You know, there's like a Bible scripture, which you probably know. Are you a Christian? It, yeah, definitely. Amen. Because, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because you have a photographic memory. You probably read the Bible. There's a scripture in Proverbs. It says, your gift will make room for you and bring you amongst important people. Well, it, tying it in with what you are saying, what, yeah. the, what exactly does that mean? Because it sounds to me you are saying, Success is only success if you're doing what you were born to do. If you're doing something else and you're successful at it, it's not really success. That's a tricky line. So that was my junior school. Mm. You were asking me a question about the time to do all those other things. Maybe we'll explore them. I don't know. Yeah. Um, your gift. Uh, so there's a very beautiful drawing of, I think, a monkey and a fish and a snake and a giraffe. Mm. And there's a caption around, uh, if intelligence was measured by our ability to climb a tree, only the monkey would be deemed intelligent. Sure. The fish and whatever would not. We, we really need to find our gift. The problem is gifts have been defined by, like I said, the powerful, which we need to change. <clears throat> now, the idea that you need to play with the gift you were born with, which is what you were saying. I'm nervous about it because there is a drawing of Baromian rings. Baromian rings are these intersecting rings. Mm -hmm. And at the center of these four Baromian rings is what's called your purpose. Now your purpose, which I'd like to think is the alignment of your gift, nature, the universe, and society is what are you good at? So that's what you're born with. Yeah. What are you good Naturally at? Naturally good at. Naturally. Okay. Like, Book jive and you know when when a song comes on with Chris Brown, everyone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when there are wars, when there's conflict, you're the guy that people call. Ushaga, you you're the war guy. What are you good at naturally? Is just Mpiyaki. one aspect. Mpiyaki. Yeah. 
It's just one aspect of your purpose. Then it is, what does society need? Because what you're good at might not be what society needs. At the time. You might be in a beautiful singer, but you're born in a time where people need to hunt. And the best form of hunting is in silence. But when are you just want to sing, when are you scaring away all the prey? You know what I mean? So what does society need? What is society willing to pay you the maximum for? Mm. Whether they're paying you in money, in gifts, etc. And the other one is, what are you passionate about? It's one of the biggest conflicts for many people. What they are passionate about is not what they're gifted at. Yeah. So there's an amazing movie called... So what called, you can uh, be the best in the world in. There's an amazing movie called Goodwill Hunting with Matt Damon and Robin Williams. And the conflict in that movie, I know it gets studied at schools as a movie review. This guy is a mathematical genius. He never Goodwill, went to school. Goodwill Hunting. Goodwill Hunting. Okay. Mathematical genius. He solved some of the toughest math problems, but he's not passionate about it. He's passionate about falling in love with a woman and going to start a life with her. Really? So I'm going back to purpose that you might be born with a gift, but you might not be passionate about it. And just because you're born with a gift does not necessarily mean it needs to imprison you, but it would be nice for you to find a merger and the center of, this is my gift. It is what the world needs. It is what I'm going to be paid for. And it's something that I'm passionate about. So that it's my purpose. And then to where you started, once you ignite your gift, whatever your gift is, you will sit with the greatest men. We speak about Jussi Akolis. He was at the NBA now meeting with those guys. He was in Europe meeting with footballers. He's, I think he's close. He's got a relationship with Johan Rupert, one of the wealthiest South Africans. Yeah. He's friends with powerful people locally abroad with his gift. He's not Barack Obama whose gift is to orate. He's not Beyonce Knowles whose gift is to sing and dance. He's not uh, Aliko Tangote whose gift is business. Business, yeah. But he can sit at those tables because he's like, you know, you know when you speak in relationships, there's this thing of what do you bring to the table? It's literally that. And society asks, the world asks, what do you bring to the table? And the only problem we have, and part of the decolonization project is, it cannot be enough that you did well at school and you have money. There are so many more gifts that we'd like you to bring onto the table. And then we, the rest of us, mm. will find ways to reward you. You're a singer. You're not good at school. You don't have money. We will reward you with the money. Sing for us. Sing for us. Yeah. We will reward you with this dance for us. I, I found that for me in terms of my love for knowledge and information, my ability to dissect it, and my ability to articulate it to people in a way that they seem to enjoy. Mm. There are people that say I'm good looking. I don't think my looks are my gift because if they were, I would be a model. I'd be on billboards. You don't think they're your gift? I, 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 when I look at like the center, the purpose, yeah. What people are like, Pen, we just want you to on a just, to, purpose. just walk around. We'll pay you money just to walk around. They don't want me to walk around. People are not paying me. With, we want you to come sing. So my gift is not singing currently. My gift is not, we want you on the sports field, miss. Hey, when you get on the field, Donna, people cry tears. When they watch you score a goal, Ronaldinho. Yeah. Currently, the gift that people invite me for, the reason I'm here, the reason people talk about me, they say I'm controversial, is because there's something in my mind in the way I articulate it that makes some of the wealthiest people in this country and the world want to sit with me. Yeah. Is it the and, gift uh, of communication? Could you bring it down to that? Vusi Tembewayo calls it, uh, when we sat on the panel show, he calls it being a knowledge merchant. Knowledge merchant. Merchant, which is a beautiful... Can yeah. you be one without communicating? He has the English, yeah, you know, knowledge, knowledge merchant. Yeah. Uh, he says in places like Africa versus the rest of the world, we undervalue people's information and education. The smartest child at school does not aspire to be a teacher or lecturer. And those are the those people, people are not rewarded and they're much. not rewarded yeah. at the highest levels. But those are the people that are meant to disseminate the knowledge and information that actually ignites society. Mm. So I accumulate knowledge. I process it. And then I almost sell it. Sometimes I give it away. And I think that's my gift. And communication to your question is in many ways. Mine is spoken, but it's also written. Hence the books. Some people are not good speakers, but they're good writers. Some people are not uh, good speakers or writers, but they're good at singing. Mm. And their form of communication is through song. 
etc., uh, etc. Et Some it's through dance. You know, there are certain dances that can evoke. I mean, there's an argument that 90% of, of communication is body language. I come into the room and I'm looking around like, and now people are like, hey, say, what's wrong? I'm like, what do you mean what's wrong? They're like, it's the way you're looking at us. Or I come in, I'm yeah, smiling. Saying something. Yeah, I'm saying, saying something. something. So yeah. <laughs> communication is in, in many ways. And for me, it's, uh, it's selling knowledge and normally knowledge that people are, wouldn't normally in, in digest in a way that people wouldn't normally get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where, where does that come from? And where, where, when, at what point did you realize that you've got the ability to become a knowledge merchant? I know you're an A student, but not yeah. every A student is a knowledge merchant. Most A students are useless. Yeah. Unfortunately. Most, most actually can't even pivot and do different things. You seem to have pivoted even in different careers. Yeah. Writing books, playing rugby, uh, doing podcasts, communicating. Yeah. So you've put yourself out there and you've been able to pivot different industries, different ways of accumulating the information. As an A student, actually it's a difficult thing to do. Most A students don't. Mm-hmm. So at what point did you realize that there could be something here yeah. that I can use to build my life and my influence? A lot of us uh, sleep on accumulated wealth, accumulated knowledge, accumulated advantage. I've written a book on parenting uh, as a man. It's, I don't think it's common for men to write books on parenting. Mm. I've written a book on parenting and one of the chapters is accumulated advantage, accumulated privilege. Uh, one of the stories is the Lebanese, some of the Portuguese in South Africa, they, um, for ease, the grandfather moved to South Africa and set up a spaza shop. And then the father took the spaza shop and he enlarged it into a supermarket. Mm. And then the son takes the supermarket and he builds a shopping center around it. That is building on what your predecessors did. Another story is your grandmother was uh, Inyang, herbalist. Your mother uh, then became a nurse or rather a pharmacist to, to create the link. So she actually took on from the family business of we are herbalists, but I will study pharmacy and sell it through one of these stores. Then the, the next child actually opens a pharmacy or a, a medicine manufacturing business. It's the same family business. My mother has been a school teacher her whole life. So I'd like to think teaching is something that I get from my mom. Um, my father was a soccer coach his whole life. He loved mentoring young boys. He owned three soccer teams. So I, I think part of it is actually inherited and not just me. But then outside of that, one of the smartest men on social media, in my opinion, is a man by the name of Naval Ravikant. He sits with Joe Rogan and one of the things he says is, when you got to school, you realize that kids made friends based on, I guess, their gifts. And he was like, I wasn't good looking. I didn't come from a rich family. So the good looking ones would flock together, basically. Oh, not, not flock together, but people would want to come to you because you're good looking. Sure. People would want to come to you because your dad, dad drops you off in a Lamborghini. Right. That's it. So he was like, what is my thing that's going to make people gravitate to, to me? And what he picked at that time was, I'm going to become the most knowledgeable person in the school. The most knowledgeable person most in the school. knowledgeable. Okay. So he started this journey to read all the books in the library, which is something that I tried to do in primary school as well. Sure. He tried, he read all the books. And then he went out and he read more books and he was like, okay, now I know more than I'm the most knowledgeable in school. Why not in the town? Why not in the city? Why not in the province? And he spent his life becoming the most knowledgeable human being on earth, or that was his pursuit. And somewhere along the way, when you accumulate so much knowledge, you get into spaces where that knowledge is needed or people are debating over something silly. And you're like, but I know the answer to this because I've got that information. Yeah. So then you start sharing it. People are like, hey, so you... And in that gay, people start saying, hey, goodness, look, I've started a property portfolio and I need you for... So you start doing that. And in you teaching, how it becomes natural is because you're just enjoying it. Or because like I said with my parents, it's just something that I think was there. My mom was a teacher. My dad was a coach. 
I'm teaching and coaching on social media. Mm. And I, I, I think that's what it is. And I'm like, but why, why can't I write a book? Why not? I've been keeping a diary. I love literature. English was one of my favorite subjects at school. So I started writing and a you're book. you're an A during student? Boston. Yeah, look, <laughs> the A student thing. It's your thing, my man. You can't run yeah, away from it. I think our opinions of A students are different. So there are kids that are not A students, but are good writers. Yeah, I'm not an A student. I never was, but I wrote a book. I know what you're talking about. But I'm, you I'm scared of going down that rabbit hole. Sure, let's just say yes. Yeah. So I started writing a book in varsity. It became my first book. It was very short. I liked it. Started, you wrote it first year? I wrote it in my third, fourth year. Okay. Yeah. No, the first book I ever wrote, I was in second year. But I never released it till much later. The what first was book that, I wrote and released. The first book I wrote was basically chapters on my thoughts on the world. Mm. Uh, how I think AIDS is engineered. How I think religion is just a collection of energy. Um, how I think Jesus was a revolutionary, things like that. But I only released that later. But my first book, Utandi Lang, I released in my fourth year. And I started selling it to my friends. And I was like, okay, this wasn't painful. And I did it again. And I did it again. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't party and club. Uh, so unfortunately, according to society, that makes me uncool and boring. But those are the things that stimulate me. Writing, reading. So I just did that. I think I've dropped the ball because if I was more focused and disciplined, I think I'm very lazy. I should at least have 50 to 100 books. Mm. Um, and maybe at some point I'll find a way to, to make it happen. Do you so, think you're living up to your full potential yet? Based on my limited knowledge of my potential, I'm probably at 15%. Um, I think I have the ability to make music like Kanye West. I believe I have the ability to build a business like uh, businesses like Crystal Visa. Mm. Um, I believe I have the ability to create amazing platforms like Joe Rogan, Patrick Bet David. I think I have the ability to influence politicians and leaders like people like Clem Santa in this country, people like George Soros, Bill Gates globally. Um, I think I have that. Yeah. But it requires... Uh, certain things currently that I lack one of them being I'm not working at the work ethic that I wish I had which is a Pakistani spaza shop work ethic or a Chinese sweatshop 16 hour days I'm not doing that yet number two I struggle with delegation and leverage mm. because we can write 100 books in one month you and I if we just plug into a network of writers this is the concept we sit every day guys go come back give us feedback how's it going how's it looking Send it to the editors. End of the month, we've got 100 books because we had 50 people sitting and writing every single day. That's how you work when you're a high-powered, high-performance individual. So I'm currently not plugged into that. And maybe over time, I will get to that. Or maybe over time, I will stop doing anything and do nothing mm. and just be quiet in the universe and become a guru and be like, nothing matters. I'm not chasing. I'm not interested. So there's that conflict as well of working your ass off in the capitalist system or just being at peace and being like, today was a beautiful day. I got to chill with the guys. We had a nice chat. I don't need to work hard. I'm, I'm fulfilled. I'm, I've eaten. My kids are good. Yeah. Um, I'm happy. But there's something you said once that intelligent men need to make more kids so that we can have more of their DNA. So if those intelligent men are also not working at full capacity, does that not drop society of what society needs? Men who are out there producing because they've got the gift, they've got the intelligence. More like to whom much is given, much will be yeah. much more expected. It's a funny uh, conundrum and dilemma we have in society today where the least able or the least value adding, let me put it that way, the least value adding people in society seem to reproduce the most. And you wonder if it's engineered by the elite so that they don't have much competition. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's like... Reproduce, you mean biologically or... Biologi have biologically, children. okay. Have children. Um, if I'm a billionaire, do I want to empower other people to become billionaires? And if they do, maybe they'll destroy my business. Or do I invest in rich people? Don't have kids. Kids are expensive, man. Have you seen the price of private school? Because I don't want you to compete. And I don't want your kids to compete with mine. 
But the poor people who are outsmart, outmaneuver, they're just workers. They can have eight, 15 kids. I sometimes wonder about that. And Elon Musk is one of the people that challenges that notion. And I appreciate it because I fully agree. Mm. If you figured out that you are some type of an asset, whether you are good looking, mm. whether you are athletic, like Serena Williams and LeBron James, whether you are some kind of a genius like Kanye West, you cannot be enough. So you will create things. You will create Yeezys. You will build Tesla. You will create things which become reproduction. It's great. But it's like, but the quality of these creations is your mind and your DNA and your being. It's like, but why not multiply that as well? Like, why not multiply that software or that hardware if you're a serious athlete? And no one is, is speaking about that. It, it, it almost feels engineered mm. in society by, from what I see. I do believe that good-looking, intelligent, hard-working people must have as many children as possible because they actually add value to the world. And I don't believe in the sterilization agenda because there are people that are like, poor people must be sterilized and not have kids. Mm -hmm. What I believe is, let's call it the poor or not value-adding. They should be allowed to also have as many kids as they want. But their children and them should not rely on the state and the system. They should live an agrarian life where if you cannot afford, go grow your own food, make your own house and end. But the idea that they breed and then we must pay a child grant really frustrates yeah. me. But um, the amazing people in the world, man, they must make more kids because they make the world exciting. The world is exciting because of unique individuals. And when you find out they didn't have kids, it's like... It feels like a waste. We do it with animals. When you find a bull that is insane, they, not even the bull, the sperm becomes expensive. And you sell it at a high price so that you go and pipe it you into... breed as many as you, you can. You breed with the best cows. Yeah. You know, and look, there's a word to be said about slave breeding back then. Uh, Willie Lynch and the guys, which was not great. Mm -hmm. So you take a LeBron James and a Serena Williams and you'd force them to breed so that you have these super slaves which they were using almost like animals, like cows, which look, we need it for this. But there's something to be said about intentional breeding, arranged marriage, and, and to be like, I think I'm a quality man. I want to find a quality woman because I want us to have quality kids. Because if we are quality and our kids are quality, we will build a quality society. And even the poorest people will appreciate having us in their society because we build we businesses. Value. We solve problems. But you're going to celebrate that I don't have kids. And the only people that are left are people that just want grants, that just steal, that just murder. <sighs> it's sad for me. So yes, I, I do believe that we must preach. So in today's society, I mean, let's say there's a young guy listening to you, what you're saying, and he's like, okay, I want to be married. And I know you don't believe in marriage. I don't. Yeah. So a young guy says, I want to be married. How then do I identify that woman that is quality? Let's say I'm a quality man. Yeah. I want to identify that quality woman that I can breed with. Mm. What, are, what are the things that you look at? I mean, you've reproduced six times. That's and I'm point. guessing you've looked at quality, Mchan. Sure. And not, not just the no. looks. There's, there are certain and things I'm always that you sober. looked at. Yeah, there are certain things that you looked at. Yeah. Uh, because it's intentional. It's mm. not something that's just happening because Penuel had a white night stand because he was strong. Sure. Now she's pregnant. Sure. It's intentional. Sure. So what do you look at? Um, Sankofa is an amazing term. I don't know if it's Swahili. I'm not Sankofa. sure. Or, it, or it's might be a Ghanaian term. I'm not sure. Sankofa is about going back to find solutions for the present or for the future. And part of the decolonization agenda is to say the West is not always right. Europeans, Americans are not always right. There were African solutions that today are being reintroduced by the same people. That said, the solutions are not right. That said, they're not right. So yeah. things like we, we use the herbs from the earth. They told us we were barbaric. Our medicine was backwards. Today, they're coming with organic and herbal Remedies, the same stuff. Herbal that we, tea, herbal, herbal teas, tea, yeah. you know. Uh, we used to build uh, houses made of uh, clay and mud and cow dung and, and thatch, straw. And we were told our architecture is primitive. Today we are being You go on holiday there now. They, today, they, today we go on holiday there. <laughs> Eco-friendly, it's green, it works with... It's, there was a way that we used to identify good partners for our children. Mm. 
not our children identifying for themselves. We would identify for our children because they are our children. We know them and we know ourselves. I know myself and I know my wishes and I know my wishes for my future generations. So when I give birth to witness, I have an idea of the family vision, which I'm supposed to sell to him as well. Mm -hmm. But if I know our family, uh, let's say it's light skinned, which means we are sensitive to the sun because we have low melanin. I'm like, no, no, no. You know what? In the society we're in, we need kids who are physically strong out there. So my boy, you know, we yellow bone and girls are going to like you. It's fine. But we need you to get a dark woman. Mm. We need some melanin injection in this family because we, we've been, our family has been dying. We'll be cancer. extinct. We're going to be extinct. We're going to yeah. be weak. Or we are short. Hey, you know, at some point it was nice to be short, but in society today, we want to be tall. So tall, dark and handsome. as short as you are, we need you to get a tall woman, my man. You know, we want tall grandkids. Um, all the way to kingdoms that would either fight over territory or that would find a useful way to collaborate. You are the people of gold. You are the people of the gold. We are the people of the maize. You guys suck at farming. You guys plant your crop dies, but you hungry. We are amazing. We are amazing at planting. Mm -hmm. Is that where your surname comes from? No, no, I mean, I'm not means something else yeah, it's know, for no, another no, no. day let's not let's not venture i see what it means <laughs> <laughs> so so you are good at gold we suck at mining we're scared of going down so in bringing these two tribes of families together we've identified that we are good at farming at feeding you are good at bringing these mineral resources mm -hmm. so we can shake hands we can sign contracts which we do today or we can strengthen the bond by saying, I've got a daughter. That the covenant now. You've got a son. Let us unite these families. The fact that they attracted to each other, it's not important. This is bigger than their desires. It is a unification of family and need. So to your question of how do you identify, you're meant to look at yourself, let's say physically, number one. You need to look at yourself mentally. So maybe you didn't do well at school. You should go and attract someone who is bet who's smarter than you. Attract someone who, if you're not as hardworking, who has a high work ethic. If you are South African and the people of the future are the Chinese, go maybe find a Chinese woman. If you are looking for the future of Africa and you're like, I think I'm a Nigerian, I've got, there's something special there. Maybe go find a Nigerian woman, a traditional Nigerian woman. But find those things and then look at your environment and your family and ask, what are we trying to build in a hundred, a thousand years? And what are future generations going to say about me when they look back and say, look, witness did really well. He made us a lot of money, but look at the children he gave birth to. They take drugs. They became killers. You've got stories now of the descendants of Mandela mm. who are destroying his legacy, who are living in houses and can't, you're like, did he pick the right people to have kids with? Because if you pick the right woman as a young man, you've, you've, it's like blessings. You've gotten everything. Hardworking, humble, respectful, servant. That woman will, will take whatever, I think Miles Monroe speaks about a woman multiplies whatever you give her. Yeah. She will take the, the, the seed you give her and she will turn it into a, a plantation. Mm -hmm. She will take the seed you give her in terms of sperm and she will turn it into a beautiful, strong family. So find a good woman who, who, who can do those things. But make sure that it's bigger than just, hey, Tony, what do you think, Kanja, Antoine? Oh, Tony, yellow bone. Hey, McFiga. That is just for sexual pleasure for, how long is sex? Three minutes? 20 minutes, minute foot, floor play, floor play. And just for that, you need someone who's going to be intentional about building your family and future generations. Mm. Mm. So going back to your development from when you were high school, primary, everything. When does the entrepreneurial side of you then come in when you started the businesses that you started? So again, I have to give credit to my family. Um, my father, not so much, sadly. I think he could have been a brilliant entrepreneur if he was trained. If he was trained? If he was trained, yeah. Do people need training to be entrepreneurs? Um, Do you think it's a matter of training or it's a matter of starting? There's, a, there's a, a lot of different arguments for the definition of entrepreneurs and yeah. all of them are right. 
All of them are right. I mean it from a perspective of an entrepreneur is a person who's able to identify problems and solve them. Okay. At a core. So there are people who very comfortably can find problems and solve them. Then the next part is to package the solution in such a way that you're getting paid. So a lot of, especially Africans, struggle mm. with that part. Packaging the solution Packaging so that they the can get paid. So they can get is that paid. why they're struggling? M- many Africans struggle there. Mm-hmm. And then the other bigger struggle is the how much are you getting paid, the pricing. It's also a very huge problem for Africa. Oh, okay. Yeah. Could be underpricing the product. Definitely underpricing. Yeah. So my father, uh, like I said, owned soccer teams, three soccer teams. He was mentoring boys in the neighborhood. Yeah. He, he was also a social would, entrepreneur, basically. He would have so been a social entrepreneur. Now. If he'd gotten paid, yeah. he would have been a social entrepreneur. So he's not an entrepreneur because there's the money aspect. That's why I was oh, like, okay. the money aspect for the me is important. The solution was there, the solution but it was, was no there. charge. Sure. So he, if he packaged it in such a way that he was getting paid, maybe he ran a non-profit organization and, and he would have had money. He used to breed greyhounds. You know, greyhounds, the greyhounds, dogs. the running racing dogs. He yeah, used to win yeah, trophies yeah. for racing. We used to go hunting with the dogs. He could have started a greyhound fast, eh? business. They super fast. One of the fastest land animals up there with the rabbits and bark and, and cheetahs. Yeah. Greyhounds are super fast. I think yeah. they're the fastest of the dog family. Yeah, they are. Yeah. They're definitely. So if he could also have packaged that into a business, he would have made money. At some point, because my father's passionate about movies, I'm passionate about movies. Him and my mom started having like an informal cinema at the backyard at our home. Where people came. Where people would come, come and pay, I think it was two cents or five cents. And my mom would make popcorn and they'd eat popcorn. The video cassette player. Video cassette player from a blockbuster. Uh, people that remember blockbusters. No, we were living in Lokshin at that time. So yeah. it wasn't cheese. The cheese. cheese came when we moved to suburbia. Yeah, but, <laughs> he's laughing. <laughs> but it was uh, what we call the missing middle today. It was cheese. Yeah, Matatin. Matatin is the township I was born in yeah. with my mom. Is and that then, where the cassette thing was that's done? That's where the cassette thing was done. Then yeah. we moved to the suburbs, Abu Park in Newcastle. My mom, my mom carried us by herself. She was a school teacher. So I was cheese from a, almost a single mother financially with three children. Who, who had a lot of debt. So yes, it's cheese on paper, but it's not because my family was rich and my father owned them, a bus, no. But it looks like cheese because my dad would do those things. Anyways, my mom, because she needed to supplement her income for us when we moved to the suburbs, she used to sell second-hand clothes a lot. Yeah. She started selling thrifting, my juice. What they call thrif- no, thrift she wasn't stores. thrifting. So thrifting mm. uh, as a concept is people that find donated or second-hand clothes mm. and they kind of clean them up and then they make them uh, boutique. But they're donated. They they can be donated or sold. Or sold, okay. Uh, I'm trying to explain this second-hand, I'm a second, which poor people. Maybe I wore it, I sell it to your mom. No? There is second-hand, there's a second-hand business. I need to s- separate it. Sure. There's a second-hand sure. business. People that don't have much money go into a second-hand shop, they find a t-shirt for five rand. They wear it. They go into a place, they find a nice couch, if you bought it brand new, it would have been 10,000. You buy it second and it's 300 rand. Then there's thrifting where people go to a second hand store mm. and they take this thing and they almost make it like a luxury good. So instead of taking the, the two rand jacket and selling it as is. And selling it, let's say for five rand, you take it as a two rand jacket and then you post it on Facebook. You're like, <sighs> unique Italian fur. And now you're selling it for like 500 rand. Instagram. Because you realize the, the value of it. Okay. So it's almost like a different... Industry. It's like antiques. Antiques versus secondhand. Sure. Anyways, it's just English. So my mom was into no, secondhand. English is important. Thanks for explaining so, it. So my mom was into secondhand. Just basic getting donated stuff or bought stuff and then add a small markup and then sell. Mm. I might choose. Uh, we lived near a park where people come take pictures for weddings. She'd go there and sell uh, drinks and ice cream and cigarettes and those things. So I think entrepreneurship, I maybe saw it from there. Maybe. My grandfather on my mother's side is an Indian man, uh, Hussein Chota Amin. According to my mom, him and his Amin family. This is your, they your were grandfather owners. from your mom's side? My mom's side. My, okay. my mother's father. Okay. They were Indians that were in business and trade. So at times I sometimes think that maybe there's also that, even though I wasn't exposed to it. So when I got to varsity, uh, so I wasn't a cheese in the sense that my mom wasn't sending me lots of money every month. I was on a scholarship. Uh, studying accounting under Ernst & Young. And my mom would send pocket money now and then, so I needed to hustle. 
So I found selling t-shirts. I started doing Provost rolls. There's, there's almost this um, unannounced school of hard knock knocks that almost all entrepreneurs go through that we don't speak about. But when you meet entrepreneurs, it's almost like we all went to the same school. We just didn't tell each other. Yeah, yeah, we did. It's like say we used to host a house party and we used to rent out a must be Kai sound. And then at some point I started books. selling books and then and you're like, recycling. it's like, you're talking about my life. You're like, yeah. Bana, all of us, we are taking my seminars. Books as well. Sure. Yeah. I sold books too. Uh, I didn't sell textbooks. I just mine. But I, I was friends with Which people are, that I'm talking. I'm oh, you, you didn't sell. I didn't sell books. other people's books. Oh, you sold. I only your sold books. my books. You retailed your books. Baby. Only my books. Oh, okay. But I was friends with guys who. There's a friend of mine. I won't mention his name, but he was a master of textbooks at UJ. Yeah, master. So he would. I don't know if they have secondhand bookshops now because the fun sky has been killing money in the tertiary book. What what? Yeah, they've been doing it so for years. Now. Kids struggle with selling. Kids struggle with, hey, look, if you're looking for a second year chemistry, they scared their shame. This guy was popular. He was, loved selling. So you would bring his book and say, I want you to sell this book for me. How much do you want for it? I had 200 rand. I, my man, this book is not pushing. I'll sell it for 100. Ah, okay, sure. Then goes and sells this for And then he's like, for 100, if I sell it for 100, you're giving me 20 bucks. And you're like, sure. Then he goes to people and he's like, hey, this book is three clipper. No, but three clippers too much. Like, except if you don't want it, these books are running out. And if you go to Fun Sky, it's going to be 500. So there's someone that wants it. Now, if you don't want it, it's fine. I mean, you can keep your 300. No, okay, okay, sure. But to look, the person who gave me this book is not really paying me. So I'm trying to pay 20 rand on top of the 300. Just Conan's <laughs> on. So he makes that margin plus the 20. Plus you, he was a master. People would come to his raised room and drop off their books. And then people come to his raised room and be like, do you have your accounting three? I don't know, accounting three. Like, I don't know. Just give me till the end of the thing. So, so he yeah. was, I, I knew people that sold books. Yeah, the proper ecosystem and network for ah, this thing. Come on. It, that's where we were. You know, I was at Rhodes. Um, we hosted the house parties. I was part of a group of guys called the Black Business Forum, the BBF. One of the house parties we, we hosted. So Your house party was called Black Business Forum? No, the group of guys. Oh, the group of guys who was doing the, the house Black parties. Business Forum, sure. Okay. So we hosted our house the party. The business was the party. No, no, no. We didn't have a business. We, we came together as a black business forum. Yeah. And one of the ideas that came up was, let's host <laughs> house <laughs> parties. <laughs> <laughs> Young, kids do. Young people do these things. Yeah. So one of them that we hosted, and I know you speak about this as well, about sometimes you don't need money to start a business or a venture. Yeah. We created these posters. We sent them around campus, hosting a house party on Friday. Uh, let's say, for example, 50 rand entry. Sure. Unlimited punch, what, what. And people paid. And then we took that money and we went to and buy punch. stock. Yeah. And, and, and then we hustled one of the people to let us uh, host at their house. And we hustled Umchita who claimed that he wants to be a DJ one day. Like, Antoine, so exposure, Antoine, exposure, Antoine. <laughs> you paid him with exposure. We paid him with exposure. <laughs> and then uh, there was another guy who had sound. I think he was renting it to a church. We're like, Tana, look, if we make money, we'll give you something. If we don't, Tana... We'll tell people that we know to like, say you rent out sound, you know, barter. Um, so one of the people we met there, and I'm going back to this thing of, it's almost like we all went to the same school. Nicolette Mashile. Yeah, yeah. The financial well, fitness she also at Rhodes. She was also at Rhodes. Okay. So when she found out we were pushing this thing, she came to me and to the gym. She's like, I'm going to help you guys push tickets. So at that point, she just took initiative. She was proactive. She... At that point, she ended up, um, this is the winner's circle. She started a bunch of winners, I think was her company at the time. Mm -hmm. She was providing coaches for schools in Grahamstown, sports coaches. And then later on, I think she did other work. And it's almost like all of us have got this hunger to do, when you listen to DJ Smoo or Oskido, also at some point selling Puravos roles outside of my club before he got allowed to DJ. It's like we all went to the to the same schools, man. And yeah, didn't Smoo wait at the gate of YFM for a very long yes, time? Yes, so Smoo used to sell called in. so many different things. So in that journey of trying to make a bit of money, this book, which is so underrated, it is so hyped, but I think we read differently. Mm -hmm. People read the Bible. And after reading the Bible, they have their own interpretation. Different interpretations, have, yeah. Maybe the easiest one is they have their own um, heroes. 
you read the Bible and you come out with the Noah. I think I want to be Noah. I want to build an ark. I want to build a big company, which is going to rescue people from the floods. The floods is a recession or unemployment. Sure. Sure. And I'm going to absorb. That's, I'm going to be Noah. That's a nice interpretation of the Bible. Eh? So you come out with Noah. Yeah. The next person comes out with Moses. Are you Christian again? I'm not. I'm not you're, Christian. You're not Christian anymore. No. Christianity is more problematic. It is more problematic than, but it goes down to interpretation. Yeah. Someone wants to be Moses. South Africa is going through apartheid and I think I want to be the voice to liberate my people. Mm. Let my people Let go. Let my people That's go. That's Mandel. It was actually Chief Albert Lutuli. Yeah. And there's a book called Let My People Go. Sure. But Moses became Nelson Mandela, Let My People Go, who became the spokesperson to go and free the Israelites, black people, from the Egyptians being the apartheid, apartheid government. government. Yeah. Uh, and it became a Moses trying to lead us to the promised land, which... Yeah. The ANC now is kind of butchering. Which they took us through the wilderness instead of ah. to the promised land. <sighs> then Mr. Fiku Penzo. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Sure. Before you get the Penzo. After what you said, you know, biblically, the Israelites go through the wilderness for 40 years before they get to the promised land. Mm. 30 years into democracy, we're still in, in the wilderness. Do you think we need 10 more years before actually things change for the better? Get into the promised land? You'll never get to your destination if you're going in the wrong direction. We can I get in that they were going through in circles in the so, wilderness. So, there. so I, I'm not going to interpret that scripture because, again, I'm not a pastor and I'm. Yeah, my man, you're a pastor, but no, let's no, continue. No, no. So, so, so I'll, I'll say this if you want to interpret it for understanding, mm. the reason they went around in circles was because they needed to learn something, they needed to experience something. So, Maybe South Africans need to suffer. And learn something. And learn something. Sure. So that we then are like, you know what? We actually took this freedom for granted. We actually were not pulling our weight. And, and maybe that's the lesson. Yeah. But it's not necessarily that just because we're going around in circles, we'll get there. There are people that spend their whole lives in going circles. Going around in circles. They are they learning change. nothing. Yeah. They are still okay, voting for the same party. They are still su uh, supporting the certain types of leaders. You are trying to build a black economy. You're trying to uplift black business, but you're refusing to buy black. And you're wondering why there's high unemployment. Mm. You're wondering why you're oppressed. You will keep going around in a circle until you wake up. But if you don't wake up, you will remain oppressed. Yeah. So my whole thing is in the 10 years, we won't reach the promised land if we're not moving Towards. in the right direction. Sure. So we need to move in the right direction. People like Opens will read the Bible and they come up with uh, Solomon. King. <laughs> the wisest man. <laughs> Now Solomon also yeah. to ha happened to have the honeys. Yeah. Many wives, so, so many on the honeys and the kids. So like, no, man, I think a white pipe Is that what you identify? No, I think I'm <laughs> cheater. You know. <laughs> so millions of people have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Sure. By Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah. But again, like the Bible, what did you take out of it? Yeah, I know Kiyosaki says we must invest in property and you know, you must mind your business and McDonald's. And you're like, okay. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it became a biblical exercise. I had a similar spiritual uh, journey watching the Avengers. Marvel, mm. movie, uh, fiction. Watching Thanos, who sacrificed his daughter, Gomorrah, which is like the sacrifice of Jesus, so that he could gain the soul stone. And the soul stone allowed him just like a god, because he snaps his fingers and half of the universe disappears. It's like the flooding. So there's these biblical aspects, but what I took from there was something deeper than just action. What I took from Rich Dad, Poor Dad was Robert Kiyosaki saying, rewire and recondition how you view things. I'm going to teach you about money. How you've been taught about money is wrong. But he goes into more than just money. He speaks about taxes. He goes into what? It's more than money. He's, he speaks about, you know, there's a very nice quote that says entrepreneurship is a personal development course, is a hidden personal development course. Mm. Because in entrepreneurship, you go in there to make money. I'm going to go buy and sell stuff. You don't go in there to develop your ability to talk, mm. your ability to negotiate. You don't plan, I'm going to travel, I'm going to be in bloom. Sometimes you suffer I'm, there, my man. You suffer. You, you, you are under, you, the people you meet, losses, dealing with failure, overcoming, 
learning financial terms. Mm. When I want to go with Forex because you just wanted to make money. But now you're learning about trading, about indices. You're learning about pairs and commodities and oh, there are codes. Oh, Currencies, there's rigging countries. of currency. Yo. Now I need to study the politics of Japan because they're releasing a report which might, you're like, now you're studying politics and economy and you're like, I mean, how's this going to make money? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, Robert Kiyosaki to me was more than, or has been more than just a, pi- a personal finance guru. Rick mm. Ross for me is also so another similar. So you feel like you more than just money for and me, you were getting other stuff. Than, what, were you, what are those stuff that you were getting? It is just looking at what you've been taught in another way. You must understand that the core of Robert Kiyosaki's teaching. So Robert Kiyosaki asks, what's McDonald's business? People are like, oh, they sell burgers. You're like, yeah, no, property. their business is property. Mm. Their business is property. Robert Kiyosaki's books are on money and personal finance, but they're not. His books are on education. He speaks about his father as someone who was big in education. Yeah. And his whole fight is our education system is not working for us. From a money perspective, but it's not just money. As Africans, it's who's teaching you how to grow food? Who's teaching you how to build your own house? Who's teaching you how to bring your family back together? The core of Rich Dad Poor Dad is rewire your mind on education. And that's what I got from him. Money is one of them. And then you start looking at the elite. Mm. When the elite are telling you, go get a jab. A jab when the elite yeah. are telling you, it's wrong what's happening to Ukraine. When the elite is saying, yeah, but Hamas is a terrorist. You're like, hey, wait, Ukiyosaki said we mustn't just take what the elite tell think, us. Think, think. Let's try and think and let's try and figure out whose agenda is being served and for what purpose. The elite tell us to go to school, but it's so that we can be good workers for them. They're not trying to empower us to build our own businesses. So that's what I took from that book. And that book ignited in me entrepreneurship, probably on the deepest level where we say we're trying to make money, but we're trying to make money through service and solving problems. Then I started businesses of which one of them, the most popular one, the National Savings Club, has become my biggest failure where I was saying, Africans are poor. Africans are not financially literate. I'm going to build a platform, collect African people's money, like um, Sahara Parawa by Subrata Roy in India, Mm. which at the time had a million employees, going around collecting money from poor traders. I'll collect your money on your behalf, stock fed, and then I'll invest your money on your behalf for growth. I will be the person that grows your money for you. That's where you get an old mutual and asset managers and those people. Mm. I wanted to do that. Yeah. But again, the getting to the promised land, I wasn't ready to get there and I got burnt. I was naive. I believed in the good of people. I invested in business. I gave people money assuming, no, witness Moss is a Christian. He's a good man. He's not going to... Snake and he me. believes in the cause. Come on. Yeah. You snake me. A lot of the snaking is not your own doing. It's your own limitations. You're not financially literate. You don't know how to run a business. And even in the business world, it's very violent. You might have a good business, but with load shedding, what happens? You might have a good business, but regulation, what happens? You might have a good business, but crime, what happens? And I'm like, say, witness, that 50,000 I invest, invested. Hey, pay no, Donna, you know, it's tough. And I'm like, it's, I've got people that invested in me. And they want their money back. And I was happy. Again, Jesus moment. I became the crucifixion. Uh, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Where I was called a scam artist on social media. I was accused of things. And I was like, you know, I understand the power of propaganda. And I'm like, this is a learning moment. Mm. Not what many did you people, learn from the failure? Not many people write businesses on uh, books on business failure. People write a book on when they've made it. Not on failure. I was like, I'm going to write a book on failure. And I wrote The Rise and Fall of the NSC. NSC. And the book is about how I started a business and how it failed. I was doing it for many reasons. One of them was, I want you guys to know my story. I don't want they to be like, yeah, Robert Mugabe was a, 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 a dictator and he was a tyrannical. And you're like, no, we want to hear his opinion. His side of the M- story. Maybe, maybe he was. Which we never got to hear, by the but way. But we want to hear it from him. And did I was like, guys, this is what I did. I, I have no idea. I don't think he did. I have no idea. So I, I wrote that book for that. But I also wrote that book because I'm like, there are so many people whose businesses have failed and they need to know they're not alone. And they need to know, guys, it's okay to fail. Because again, one of the things Kiyosaki says, one of the things Gary Vaynerchuk speaks about, one of the things I think even Elon Musk as an engineer, as the core of engineering, 
believes in is the building blocks of anything come with failure. When a child learns how to walk, it's from falling. When you learn how to ride a bicycle, it's from falling. Mm. So how can it be that a child has never been taught about business? You expect their first business to just... No, Baba, no, 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 no. So I'm like, let I made failures. I made mistakes. I got attacked. Let me tell you how I failed so that when you start your business, you can hopefully yeah. be like, hey, I remember Pen speaking about one of the stories is about Makuinya. I had a fish and chip shop at Gandhi Square and I was trying to bring in foot traffic because you need something that attracts people into your shop. And I was like, let, I was selling fish and chips, but I was like, let me do Amakuinya. The amount of stress we went through in selling Amakuinya and getting people that complain and what, what, it was so stressful. It was a waste of my time and it wasn't worth it. There's a line that says it takes the same amount of energy for a lion to hunt a mouse mm. as it does for them to hunt a buffalo. But then you look at the reward at the end. And I was like, I should have just focused on getting a fewer clients walking in to buy higher ticket meals, come yeah. buy the 50 rand meal. Then people complaining then about people the queen. Then people coming to buy a one rand queen. Yeah. It's like, Ish. but it was a, a lesson. Not to say that method doesn't work. It's for the person reading it to be like, oh, I know where Peno fucked up here. I could have. He was right done with the Queen's strategy, three. but yes. he should have done this. It's like, okay. but you learned. You didn't have to make my mistake. Engineering and innovation is someone creates the light bulb, someone takes the light bulb and creates electricity, someone takes electricity and then they create a phone, someone takes the phone, adds internet and creates a smartphone, someone takes a smartphone and turns it into a business. But it's not the person who turns the cell phone into a business did not invent the light bulb. Mm. Do not invent the internet. So or electricity we will make the mistakes and send them out there so that people can then take those mistakes and be like, you know, I started this business because Upen had a podcast that was small and didn't work. And I used to watch him and say, hey, Indoni Flopala. And when I started my podcast, the first thing I did is I signed marketing deals with certain brands so that we had money in the podcast. The first thing I did is I pre-signed certain great guests and offered them money up front, like a record label, uh, like a sports team, I gave an advance. Witness, you're going to give me 12 interviews over the next year. I'm going to pay you up front. I'm going to take out a loan because I know I'm going to make this money back. I realized we all pen flopped and why it took them so long to grow. I mean, I'm going to jump, but it's because they taught me. So my book was meant to be, it's meant to be my contribution to the black South African child's journey into business and entrepreneurship and the failures we have. Do you think then young black people have a good relationship with failure? Because it sounds like you've developed over the years a good relationship with failure where you're not scared of failing anymore. <sighs> that is not true. It's not true. It seems it's like not it. true. No, failure is... Well, okay, um, what's your relationship with failure? Failure is... Psychologic... Failure causes a psychological accident. Mm. Not a physical accident. a psychological accident. So when you have been in a car accident and you're like, Yabo pen the sky is la... Ain't on, I was in a car accident. You know, to this day, Ain't on, sometimes when I lift things and I'm like, Antona, but I'm sure when you get in a car, you've been in an accident. So you're like, Ain't on, look, hey, I'm more cautious when I drive, but now I pay more attention to the traffic lights and those things, but I can't say I'm not scared. Failure, like heartbreak in a relationship, causes psychological trauma. Where when I see a girl that looks like the girl that broke my heart, my heart skips a beat. Okay. Just says, Donna, you know, <laughs> yeah. when the new yeah. shows you flames. Yeah. So when that girl like, hey, Penal, he says, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> stay away from Please me. Please <laughs> stay right there. Do not come closer. Yeah. It's Don't like, traumatize you know, man, me. The girl's done nothing to you, but she reminds me of someone that's... Sure, she represents the pain, basically. Yeah, so I don't have a good relationship with failure, but... I, I have been trying to learn from failure and pull from it and just become psychologically stronger. Mm. And what helps is obviously being with other people that have also... But for the average child, man, everything about our schooling system is anti. Anti-failure. I mean, our schooling system is not even built on mastery. What that means is if you get 70%, it's fine. Move on. It can't be fine. Getting 70% for a subject means that there's a chance that 30% you don't know it. You don't know it. And yeah. that 30% might be the reason you struggle in grade 10. Now imagine, uh, and um, Sal Khan, who built the Khan Academy, speaks about this. Imagine putting a foundation for a skyscraper and saying, no, you know what, the foundation is 60% done. Let's build. 
<laughs> that skyscraper is going to fall. You're meant to go back. Every child, our schooling system is meant to be like, you are right a test. You get 60%. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 60%, you know, we're going to give you the same test. Or because you already know the 60% we removed, we're going to give you the same test with the 40%. Write it again. Of the 40%, you still get some wrong. Okay. We removed that. You got right. Until you get 100%. Mm -hmm. Now you move on. So we need to embrace positive failure. Mm. I've got good intentions while I'm doing this thing. And then we need to encourage, because it's psychological, when you failed, a form of therapy for business failure. Almost like a dragon's den. You know in dragon's den, they come and pitch their businesses. Yeah. You almost want to show, and maybe this is a business idea, you almost want to show where you have these business experts that sit with people who come and explain their business that failed. And then you've got these experts that ask, tell us what was happening here? What was happening? And they diagnose like a doctor, like a business doctor. To say, this is where your business failed. This is what you did wrong. Oh, and then other people are like, ish. And they're like, okay, now that you're here, we've got a fund, hopefully. We want to give you money to go and retry that business or retry that idea. Sure. Or we're going to partner with someone who's doing the same business as you. And we want you to go and help them do the thing that you were doing that you failed at and try it in a different way. So that people can learn, man, just because you failed doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Mm. You can go back mm. and try but it again. How does someone then um, pen after the failed tremendously, publicly for that matter, mm. then rebuild themselves? I mean, you failed publicly. And you said they dragged you on social media, mm. but you, you rebuilt your life. I still own, but own there was evil a, money today. Yeah, but there was a point where you were depressed because yeah, of yeah. that. That's the part where I want to know how did you get out of that? And, and there's a girl who broke your heart. I don't know if it's one or a few. It's a few. It's a few that broke your heart and broke your confidence. A good looking guy like you, you are still heartbroken. You were not spared. So meaning it's so heartbreak is not for ugly people. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did you? That was all satire. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I take it back. Um, the women that broke my heart still to this day are amazing, amazing women. I think I've only dated like the most amazing women out there. And the reason they broke my heart is because they'd had enough of my rubbish. I put them through the most. I showed them flames. And it oh, got to a point. A no, I'm this a perpetrator. So the perpetrator. It got you to brought a point, it upon yourself. Yeah, I came to a point where they're like, ah, we can't take it anymore. But it broke my heart. It's not like my pain is any less. Yeah, yeah. But uh, unlike so many other people, I take accountability. I, I understand what led to my heartbreak. Um, I'm, I'm spoiled compared to other people. Uh, people do not have thick skin. And people do not have a multitude of gifts. I can only imagine for the average person what business failure, heartbreak, divorce losing a loved one to death, what it would do to them psychologically. I grew up knowing that I'm decent looking. I didn't know I was good looking until I got to varsity. I thought mm. I was normal, but I grew up decent looking. People don't call me movies, I'm ugly. So I didn't have to struggle with physical inferiority issues. I grew up being very good at school. So I had uh, smart. I was good at sports. So mm. I grew up, it's, it's a danger by the way, Growing up feeling like you're great. Because when you fall... Were you popular you as well? High school? I was popular for the things that I do. Yeah. Not because I was a cool mchita. Uh, no. You were popular. That's enough. I was popular for the things that I did. Yeah. And then later on, I did a lot of research into entrepreneurship. Studied a lot of books. Read a lot of books on failure. And I've always admired certain role models. One of them who I unashamedly speak about being Jacob Zuma. And you watch... Mshulos. Mshulos, yeah. So... Mm. As a role model for adversity, you know, when, when you are being attacked from all sides, oh, okay. ANC, parliament, you're being accused media. of rape, the media, corruption, Guptas, and you watch, for me, this is what I'm saying, we read the same books, watch the same movies, but we take out different things. There were people watching Zuma when he get attacked and then see him laugh. And they're like, this guy doesn't even take us seriously. Whereas to me, I'm like, I think he's laughing as a coping mechanism. Yeah. I think it's him... If he doesn't laugh, he's going to cry. If he doesn't laugh, he's going to break he down. A lot, eh? If he doesn't laugh, he might actually retaliate violently to the people accusing him of things. So instead, he chooses to sing and laugh as a way to cope. Um, 
and then studying a lot of books of people that just deal with various adversity. I mean, we have got so many stories. Jesus Christ. We've got stories of our liberation people. We've got stories of Abu Tupac. We've got stories of our mothers who have struggled through violence, through poverty. Business failure. I went to two of my mentors at the time and I'm like, yeah, I don't know what to do. I owe investors money. I'm so stressed. And both of them asked, how much? I'm like a million rand. Both of them laughed. Laughed at you? They laughed at me. They're like, hey, welcome to the club. Come to us when you owe 10 million. I was like, no chance. You can't say that. My heart. And they're like, yeah. When you have a, a child and they come to you in grade 10, they're like, my heart's broken. My girlfriend says they don't love me. I'm never going to be, be with another girl again. You laugh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tony, welcome, welcome to Mcholo. And it was like, fuck the time. It doesn't understand. No, no, I understand. So they were understanding something. And I needed to go through that process because it's part of my journey. It's part of what's built my thick skin. But I've always thought I'm great, bro. And I don't need validation from anyone. I don't need a president or a king or a billionaire to be like, you're so smart. <laughs> like, I know. Because my intelligence and my belief comes from within. I know I'm great. Mm. So when I failed, I failed, but I always knew it was just a failure. Because I've done so many great things. Imagine you, you get heartbroken, but you've dated like seven beautiful girls. It's just one that broke your heart. It's just one. Yeah. You've had so many businesses. You've made so much money for people. You've traveled and it's one business failure. Yes, it hurts people, which is not to downplay it, but it's, it's one and you can still do so much more. You cannot imprison yourself to one failure. And that requires now taking time out. You've just been in an accident physically. You need to go recover. You can't, your leg, your knee took a hit, but you still want to walk and run. You want to damage it further. Take a step back. I took a step back. I always believe in going home. Now, home is not just a building or a house. Home is your family. It's the people that knew you before you were anything. The people that will, will wipe your palms if you start pooing on yourself because you're, you're sick with a disease. The people that will feed you even if you offer them nothing. People like your mother who like witness my child here eat. Like, mom, I can't do anything for you. It's fine. You're my child. I love you. The people that knew you before you were anything, you go back there because that's a safe space and you recover. And for people that watch Dragon Ball Z, it's like you're going into a chamber. Connelly back chamber, to the chamber, Kong, yeah. To go and rebuild yourself and to go and refine. If it means going back to primary, high school, play sports, exercise, gym, eat well, just go and do healthy exercises. But go, go get away from the accident the failure and go and do something. If it means go getting a small job, you start off selling t-shirts, go back to t-shirts. Go back to your beginning and be like, I'm gonna, I want to refine my greatness again. And then rebuild your mind. And in that time, be aware. One of the things that I have, I've been in a car accident before, is the car that was coming to hit us. My senses were awake. I was fully, I held the steering wheel, it hit us, we spun, but I was looking at everything. My son was in the seat with my brother, I had my uh, family friends at the back. I was fully aware and I wanted to control this thing. I am fully aware because one of the biggest mistakes is when you're going through a tough time and you're not aware. When, when that storm comes again, you won't see it. So you need to be aware mm. and you need to be like, I'm in pain, I'm crying. This is, this is tough. I'm scared. I'm scared. I think I had two death threats. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is real. I'm like, okay. Yo. Be aware. So that when you come out, you're like, and I was fully aware of what was happening there. Mm. So I, I did that. And like I said, I did a book. I've counseled and, and mentored many people. I speak about my business and my business failures. And I think I did so much. I still owe people money. And look, I still pay some of them and I'm hoping to pay all of them. And it's still a journey. Your intention is to pay back all of it. Yeah, and which I don't have to. But that was also a lesson for me, which now I teach other people. Guys, don't guarantee and promise people stuff. You can guarantee and promise that I'll do my best. That's all. But business is tough. 
See how Kolisi can't leave South Africa. We promise we'll come back with the World Cup. Hey, hey, hey Baba, don't do that. Mm. We promise we will do our best. That's it. Mind you, in business, especially as black people, we're not used to this thing. We're new. We're, ah, we're new. Pen. We're learning. Other we're learning companies, as much as we can. Other companies will lose a billion rand. They'll send out a report. They'll sit with creditors. We'll give you two cents on the rand. And they'll be like, we're wrapping Dude. up. We're, and they move on. There's They're a guy like, I was interviewing. Huh? And the interview is like, no. Then we built a, we built a billion rand portfolio. And then things didn't go well and I left. Yeah. Start another company. Aye, but like, you what? can't. Huh? Huh? And it's okay. It's like, no, I went, I went away to, mm-hmm. I went away overseas to recoup, went back and started another business. Yeah. And my, my, my black mind is thinking, Imali Zabandu. <laughs> Imali Zabandu. One of the things I admire about, I don't know if Zuma is the guy. I just can't think of better role models. You want Black people, whether it's through Christianity mm. or whether it is through Ubuntu, just as an African concept, yeah. we are a very forgiving people. We are a very understanding people. But you have to ask for forgiveness. And you have to apologize. And you have to face the people as angry as they are. Mm. Guys, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Not to say that they'll forgive you and they won't try to harm you. They might. Yeah. They're angry. Now they're being led by emotions. But I can tell you that does so much more than running away, disappearing. And disappearing. Be honest. Witness. I'm so sorry. I thought I was cool. But I I'm so sorry. I will try and fix what I can. But I'm sorry. Later on, when you're doing something else, there are people that will be like, I'll never work with that guy. I lost money. There are many more people who will be like, I remember when that guy lost our money and he came up and he was honest and he told us, guys, I charge your money. I'm sorry. And he explained exactly what happened to the money to a point where if he was given the money again, he'd do things differently. I had investors who, whose money I lost who said to me, and this now gets me emotional because there were people who invested in me and when I failed, their true colors came out. I always knew you were this and that. I never lied to you, which means they actually didn't believe in me. Mm. They were just trying to make money. Ish. Then there were people that genuinely believed in me and they're like, bro, you're young. Mistakes happen. You tried your best. And it's like, if you tried your best, it's like, I believe in you. And they're like, if you ever need more money, please let me know. I'm like, Fitz, I just lost like 20,000 of your money. You can't say that to me. And they're like, if you ever need more money, Please let me know when I'm here. Mm, those and are your people. So those are your people to a point where today I tell entrepreneurs, don't take money from everyone. Take money from your people. Be, be selfish about who you take money from. You need it. You're going to go take money from the wrong taxi boss. And it's not your person. You're going to go take money from the wrong drug boss. And you lose the money. And they take you out. You're going to go take money from your mom. And you'll fail and your mom will be like, it's fine, you're my child. This was going to be an inheritance anyway. And if you did things the right way, you're my, I'll help you again. Because I know what you're trying to do. I know you've got big dreams. And I want you to win. So be very selective in who you take money from. Rather, don't take the money. Mm. You want to take money and be like, Don, I think I'm going to lose this money. It's like, Penzo, it's fine. Don, I think I'm going to lose this money. Oh, what do you mean, Don? I can't tell you. Not, no, Don, I'm going to try my best. But it's like, oh, Don, I then go for it. Please don't give me money, which was one of the mistakes I made. I had people give me money saying, this is money for my children's education. Hey, when they called, crying, telling me, this was my child's money for school, broke me. Those are the things that led to the depression, not the failure of the business. Mm. The people are disappointed. But now you want to tell some pen, I've got a million rand. My father left me a million. Put that million in a savings account and a fixed deposit. If you'd like to invest in me, m- max 5 to 10%. Yeah. Let me go fail with 100,000. 50,000, 100,000. If, at I, least make, still if I make some money back, I'm going to give you the, the money. I'm going to take 100,000. I'm going to 20,000. I'm going to now 20. I'm going to 50,000. And now I'm like, okay, now I've got your 100,000 to play with. Because at least now we've covered the risk. But don't give me money that you're not willing to lose. Rather keep that money for yourself as savings or invest in yourself. Go learn a skill. Go learn how to fix cars, go get a sh- do a short course, go and do a honors, master's, mm. go and buy an Uber, do something for you. Don't give it to me. 
Oh, that's valuable advice. Yeah, man. and that's not just for me. That's for anyone. Don't just take money and invest in Steinhoff. No, it's a trusted company. So you took your whole mother's your pension. Everything. No, Baba. You need to diversify your portfolio and manage your risk. And if you're really not sure, I know money is hot. About 40, lot of money, inheritance, money is shit. It wants to leave. Cool down. Leave that money in a savings account. You almost want to tell people money that you've inherited or want big. Put it in a savings account just for six months. Don't touch it. It doesn't matter what I gave you. No, I'm trying to witness to get a Bitcoin man. Don't touch it for six months. I need you to be disciplined, to be like, I'm actually fine without this money. So that when you start investing it, you do it sober. Because when you get it, you, you become drunk. It will be a shit. We need to do money better. Anyways. So if there's a young guy out there watching. And a young lady. And a young lady. Of course. Young guy, young lady. Um, and they're saying a pen. You and witness speaking from a position of privilege. Mm. Uh, you don't know what I'm going through. Sure. What would you say to those young people? If they really believe in what they're saying, then they are right. If they believe in what they're saying, if they're right. If you believe me and witness are speaking from a point of privilege, you are right. Don't listen to us. Go find the person that speaks from your point of struggle. Follow them. If you win with them, it's fine. If you lose with them, fine. We are speaking to people who actually believe us and who identify with us in some way. I do not want to beg people to come into this church of education. Mm. Don't come here. Because there, so, there are so many business books, so many money books written by black men, black women, black boys, black girls, Indians, Chinese, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, people from Sri Lanka, people from Canada. There are so many. You can get role models from... You go on the internet and you're looking for a millionaire who is an albino from Spain. You'll find them. And you like, I identify with that person. Go to that, but don't come to us. So people that have excuses and people that have a problem for every solution are not my type of people. They must go and queue for a grant. That's where they'll get their mana from. The mana we're serving is a mana that you need to not get from the sky, but that you need to plant and you need to cultivate and you need to weed. And even if it's a bad season, you go again. That's, that's who I'm here for. I need people who are plugged into saying, I know that life is tough and I will overcome. And just like witness no Penola, I also want to speak from a place of privilege. Mm. I also want to go through the struggle when I speak. I'm like, you know, when I started my business and I made my first million to, hey, he's like, you know, like, yeah, I'm young charger like you guys. But I realized the problem is that I didn't believe. And as long as you guys don't believe, make sure your CV looks good. Make sure you've got a nice picture of yourself, being professional on your CV. And your references so that you get a good job. Oh, go queue for a grant. Mm. But where we are, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the weak. Yeah. Business, like I said, is a personal development journey. Masquerading as profit motive. It is where you sculpt yourself and you develop a thick skin. And one of the most important things people need to understand about business, just business, but life in general, but business specifically. Business is not so much how much you make. It is who you become in the journey. That's how Donald Trump can be billions in debt and then bounce back and make billions. It's not because of the money. It's because of who he became. Jay-Z says, put me anywhere on God's green earth. I triple my worth. Yeah. Uh, he's basically saying it is not that I have a million or a billion. Therefore, it is I have the mindset and the work ethic to Make a million or a billion. So you can take it away, Kanye West. Yeah. Because I'm a creator, because I'm this thing, I will do it again. I may not do it in music, I might do it in clothing. I may not do it in clothing, I may do it in something else because I have built myself into something. That's why a lot of companies, they, they burn to hire entrepreneurs because they know when they hire an entrepreneur, the entrepreneur doesn't come there waiting for a salary. The entrepreneur comes there wanting to solve problems. They understand the finances of the, of the business. They understand they need to cut expenses. They understand. So it's like, but entrepreneurs are difficult to hire because they're like wild people. Yeah. So if you'd like to join us, man, just keep listening to the education. We do these things because we want you to grow. Because some of you out there are more powerful than us by far. But we have been brought into your path.
to come and give you a small tool along your way. Because in future, we are going to need you to create jobs for our kids, to fight wars for our country, to give us information that we were not aware of. Mm. But it, it requires us to also be like, guys, we're here. We also want to play a part in, in this journey. So that's my advice to that young boy and young girl. Yeah, I love it. I Goodness. appreciate you. Thank you, brother. I appreciate your work. And as you were speaking, man, you made me realize that this entire thing is an ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, for Penwell to exist and do what he does best, there has to be another guy somewhere who's building that construction company. Yeah. There has to be another guy who's cultivating his singing career. Yeah. There has to be another guy who's building the tech businesses, another guy who's growing the food, another guy who's making sure that policies are taking place in the country and we can't one person cannot do everything correct all of us are playing a role and for you guys who are watching you know just step into your gift and your purpose you know play your role you know it doesn't matter how small the role that you are playing is and perhaps one day we'll have you here in the winner circle and you tell tell us about all the things that you've done uh, to win and continue to win and if you haven't subscribed click on that subscribe button the notifications bell comment let us know what your thoughts are share this video man i think more young people need to hear this story and need to hear your thoughts pen thank you yeah most of the time you're interviewing other people of course and uh, and i've seen when people call you they want to ask you about your kids yeah, yeah. six kids and whatever yeah, yeah. yeah there's value for that in society sure, sure. of course uh but i think there's value for what you did Today, Thank you. You know, so I appreciate it. From me and my team broadcasting live from Johannesburg, it's more than just money. Ciao, ciao. Cheers. Bye, bye, bye. Go for Shkumu Penwell. Shkumu Penwell.